You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Oh, that's so much better. A good cold shower and a change of clothes, and the world looks all new again. You don't know the half of it. Oh, wait a minute. Cold shower? I thought you were getting a tea. I haven't quite got to that. Uh, look, you best sit down. David, we've got no time for that. We're the Sonic Society, the world's largest and longest-running showcase in modern audio drama. I'm well aware of that. And it's episode 805. I'm well aware of that, too. Just as I'm aware that it's the Steam Portland Chronicles, a gothic, steampunk, alternative reality horror series set in an alternative world Portland, Oregon, where the year is always 1889. In this timeless setting, vampires are integrated into society, albeit somewhat reluctantly, and the world is sprinkled with monsters, mystical beings and mysterious phenomena. But that's just the problem. The show? No, the phenomena. Look, perhaps we'd best have our tea in the tortoise and discuss it there. Discuss what? We, we escaped the end of all things, didn't we? That we did. But things turned out... wrong. Wrong? Wrong. How wrong? About one foot and five inches. I think I should have had a hot shower. We set the tortoise to return us here, but we didn't come back to the same place. We came back one foot and five inches off. So the tortoise miscalculated? (laughs) If only the old girl were that faulty. No, but I've checked our navigation systems and nothing is wrong there. Therefore, to paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, the universe is wrong. Sherlock Holmes said the universe is wrong? He said when you've eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains however improbable must be the truth. The universe is wrong. The universe is wrong. What, What'll we do? Well, first we'll go to the East Side Ripper, and then we'll figure out what the problem is. So you're saying it all begins right here? On the Sonic Society. On this episode of Nightmares from the Shadows, we bring you tales of mystery, sagas of horror, and stories of the unknown. Our first installment comes from the alternate world of Portland, where vampires live and work side by side with their human kin. And all sorts of creatures, fair and foul, walk the same earth as humans, who are only now discovering that they are not alone in this world. Besides all the industry and invention, the science and discovery, the advancement of mankind with steam carts and airships and mechanical marvels, there also dwells a mystical side of Earth, which lay undiscovered and up until now undisturbed. Here in a Portland that never was, but would be most likely to happen, where a single turn of fate might transform the Portland we know into one that is unknown but familiar. The vampires and mystics are as commonplace as mechanics and science. Where discoveries of the natural world lay alongside discoveries of the more unnatural. Join us now for... The Steam Portland Chronicles. Encounter with the East Side Ripper. The year was 1889. Actually, it's been 1889 for a number of years now. 1889 was the last year we knew with any certainty. After that, things got a bit confusing. So much so that it has been quite convenient to name the year 1889 and go forward from there. A few individuals resisted doing this and went famously mad. That was the year 1889. Some years later, they died by their own hands. Their graves lay as a grim reminder of their tragic folly and as a warning to the rest of us. And their tombstones list the year of their fated death as 1889. I shall describe to you my singular encounter in my younger days with the most nefarious personage that the city of Portland had ever to encounter and the true accounts concerning these events involving the East Side Ripper. However, not as accounted in the Portland Chronicle under my byline, Miss Janice Jeffries, staff reporter, but instead 
to include details which were deemed not for public consumption. Tuesday, April 3rd, 1889. East side Portland, just off the banks of the Willamette River. At two o'clock in the morning, Hester Morton rarely had anyone accompany her on her walk home from her regular dance hall entertaining, unless they were paying for the rest of the evening. Tonight, she had a most surprising encounter that would account for the rest of her evenings to come. Stay away! Portland indeed had its share of nefarious activity, to be certain. Of murders, mysterious deaths, and disappearances, this city wanted for none, make no mistake. And among those, a great number had remained unsolved. In fact, Portland as a city was quite infamous worldwide for people utterly disappearing. People went missing quite regularly in Portland, and there was a healthy trade in the presumed dead or forgotten being shanghai to ports unknown from here. But when bodies began to be discovered on random early mornings on the dark and foggy streets of the east side of Portland, and when it was clear that this was not the function of some random robbery or disagreement gone awry, but instead, by the condition of the bodies, cut and slashed and bloodied as they were, something monstrous, something inhuman was at work, and the city of Portland took a collective notice. And soon this monster became known as the East Side Ripper, and what's more, it was also assumed that this monster was a vampire. It was to this end that my editor, Liam Stark, had assigned me to interview the vampire liaison of Portland and to travel into the slum district of North Portland and meet with him there. Jeffries, we need an angle on this vampire run amuck business. Here it is, the first year when vampires are allowed into the annual city ball, and now these shocking vampire murders. <laughs> Chaos and irony, I love it. We don't know that it is a vampire doing the murders for certain, Liam. That's why Roland McGraw came here in his airship. Well, who else could it be? I intend to ask Roland that very question. I shall not upset the fair listener with a detailed account of such murder so as to disturb one's morning coffee or afternoon tea. But suffice it to say that the three victims shared the similar attributes of being young, female, of questionable morality or profession, and residing in or being found in the southeast quarter of the city. But more significant was the manner and means by which their bodies had been eviscerated and gutted like a common stock animal in a slaughtering house. The immediate assumption was made that this was the work of a vampire that had gone feral, losing its civility and hunting for prey in the human sector of the city like some predatory monster. To that end, the great Roland McGraw, the foremost authority and hunter of feral vampires, had been summoned from England by authority of the highest echelon and diverted from his American lecture tour currently in San Francisco, to address the issue. And by address the issue, I mean that Mr. McGraw was engaged to hunt down the feral vampire in our fair city, not unlike it was some kind of big game animal. We awaited with bated breath the arrival of his celebrated airship, the Silver Bullet, the great lighter-than-air behemoth, with great anticipation as we could not tolerate one more savage attack upon our human community. When Mr. McGraw arrived, he was given full access to the coroner's basement to examine the bodies and details from police reports of interviews with locals and excerpts from the Portland Chronicle recounting the events. After reviewing all this data, Mr. McGraw was prepared to report on his findings and I had made it just in time to catch his report. Come in, gentles, come in. Yeah, I'd offer you some tea, but they have not supplied me with enough to go round. My, my, we are an esteemed bunch, aren't we? Inspector Ferris, of course, and our esteemed lady mayoress of the city. It is my pleasure, sir. We are fortunate enough to have your expertise in this most dire matter. The pleasure is mine, lady mayoress. I was getting a a bit stir-crazy doing mere lectures across your fair nation. Uh, But extensive safaris into yet-to-be-explored lands don't pay their own way. And we must stir the pot of patrons every now and then to finance them. I jumped at the chance of engaging in this promising diversion. (laughs) Ah, and this pen and ink lady must be the editor of the local newspaper. I'm not an editor, Mr. McGraw. Just a reporter from the Portland Chronicle. Pleasure to meet your acquaintance, sir. Likewise, yes. I should have known. 
A lady wearing trousers is more apt to be combing the streets for stories and sniffing down vague leads instead of <laughs> sitting in an office deciding how to word the next day's headlines. Mm. You're always glad to indulge the press. Perhaps I could supply you with details of my next upcoming adventure for your readership. Hmm? Anything from the celebrated Roland McGraw would be much appreciated. You said you had findings for us, sir. Ah, yes, to business then. Very Americus of you. Um, please, uh, my ladies and gentlemen, sit where you can. Stand where you must. <clears throat> yes. I have an answer for your dilemma, though I don't think you're going to like my findings. We are prepared for anything, sir. Are you, then? Well enough, well enough. What is it? What have you found? Have you located the monster? No, no, I haven't located it as such. Be advised that the populace is quite on edge about this feral vampire running amok in our fair city. There's talk of rounding up all the vampire citizens, civil or no, shutting them up into the North District and burning it all to the ground. Tut, tut, that would be unfortunate. And be yet another unpardonable atrocity to the vampire citizens of this city. And who, may I inquire, is this gentleman who speaks with such vim and vigor? This is Bartholomew de Wells, ah. who is an appointed advocate of the vampire community here in Portland. While vampires are technically citizens of our fair city. Whose taxes you collect in exchange for promise of constabulatory protection from vigilantism run amok. Vampires are not voting denizens, but they do have a voice in local affairs via representatives, um, Mr. Dwells here, mm -hmm. is present on behalf of the vampire district appointed by the city. Hey, greetings, Mr. Duells. Uh, you're not homo nosferu vampiris, then. I am not of that stock, but I am a human advocate for all vampires who dwell within city limits. Appointed by the humans to represent non-humans. Mm. How nice. Oh, <laughs> you must understand, Mr. McGraw. The vampires have chosen their liaison out of their community, uh, Friedrich von Cruz. So where is this von Cruz of the vampires? Unfortunately, he is unable to attend uh, daytime activities such as these. How convenient. Uh, Mr. Duells, mm. is, is your hope vampires become humanized to the public, no doubt? <laughs> humanized? I strenuously object to that term. Do you? Well, no matter. You said you had findings for us, sir. Yes, oh, yes, 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 to business. Uh, to one and all, I have reviewed your reports, interviews, descriptions, photographs, and newspaper accounts, and I have prepared to give you my preliminary findings. Yeah, do tell. I am sure that Mr. Duells will be relieved to hear, mm -hmm. and I suspect our reporter, Miss Jeffries, may be extremely interested to learn, though I would venture to say that the eager populace who have designs upon exacting some sort of imagined retribution upon the vampire community will be the most disappointed to hear my findings. Yeah, out with it, man! Inspector, allow me to build some suspense... Though now the effect has been entirely ruined before I can make my reveal. Which is, sir? <sighs> that we are not, in fact, dealing with a feral vampire at all. What? Impossible! A triumph! But surely... Now, now, dear gentles, my findings are both conclusive and scientific. So you say. Unthinkable! I do encourage skeptics. However, if you uh, would but set aside your preconceived notions and prejudices and follow my logic... I believe you will arrive at and agree with my conclusions. A pause hung in the air. A dangerous moment as McGraw swept the room with his eyes, keenly aware that he was beset upon by a pack of hungry predators who were about to be deprived of their quarry. Firstly, the location of the kills are indeed scattered about the city in various locations, albeit within one district. Still, they are in too wide an area to be considered a hunting territory. A feral's hunting ground is as close to its habitat as possible. These kills are outside of the domains of our vampire quarter and is not consistent for it to be active in this area, exposed as it would be. Secondly, the bodies are left with plenty of blood in and around them. Ferals who survive on blood would not let so much go to waste after a kill. And they don't abandon food or kill for sport or malice. They would stay and fight to protect, to protect their food, or drag it off to, to some hiding place. Could you place. not reference these poor victims as food? Oh, that is simply abominable. My good lady mayor, we are addressing the potential that someone is actually committing these crimes via malice and not by some primal demand for sustenance. Is not that abominable? It is only... Oh, go on. By your leave, lady mayor. Lastly... 
We have the victims themselves, with which the city coroner and I, and I concur on this principal point. It is unmistakable that the wounds inflicted on all the female victims were visited upon them and caused by a sharp slashing object like a butcher's blade or a razor or something similar. Now that is true. But feral vampires do not use tools any more than a wild dog or a jungle tiger would hold a hammer and chisel. We shall defer to your expertise. So then, by facts and evidence and inescapable logic, we must conclude that these horrible deaths are not the work of some feral vampire looking <laughs> to satisfy a base hunger, but rather that they are inescapably murders done by a character who is more evil than anything nature could spawn. And that, dear gentles, is the most horrifying aspect of these circumstances. Your hypothesis hinges upon the animal nature of a feral vampire to eliminate their possibility. Could not these horrors be committed by a civilized vampire, which still retains the use of language and tools? If we are to consider a civilized vampire to be capable of these atrocities, then we must equally consider a civilized human to be responsible as well. Spot on, Mr. Duells. Whether vampire or human, the conclusion must be the perpetrator of these unnatural acts is, well, civilized, for want of a better term. There was a silence in the room. Mr. McGraw picked up his teacup and sipped quietly as we all looked at one another. Will you help us hunt the murderer down? That is a matter for your constables and inspectors. I am a hunter. I would not be hunting an animal or a feral. It is one of your citizens that is liable. It is purely a legal matter now, and hunting a human, really, that of itself would indeed be monstrous. While we digested the unsettling conclusion that the East Side Ripper was not a rabid feral vampire, but was instead a thinking civilized person, I had to face the equally unnerving task of breaking the news to my editor, Liam Stark, who was absolutely salivating at the idea that I was to be reporting on a big game hunt here in the city of Portland with the famous Roland McGraw. My editor often encourages me to add more hyperbole to stories. He has a gentleman's agreement with the truth if it means selling more newspapers. He had all but cast the headline in lead to go to print for the morning edition, Beast Hunt in Portland's Urban Jungle. I needed to pitch an equally exciting angle to soften his disappointment, but I was fresh out of ideas and I required something fast. What? What do you mean there's to be no big game hunts? McGraw won't go on a city safari if the quarry is human. And what about my headline story? This big build-up first with a silver bullet airship landing out of the airfield. And a lead-in story about the arrival of a big game hunter hero came to save the day. Now, nothing... Nothing to show? And look, I think you're missing the big picture here, Liam. What I'm missing is my big exclusive and my big payoff. But we can milk this now for weeks instead of one, just, just one expose. What, what, what do you mean? Well, think about it. Uh, think about it. Huh? Ready? Okay. Headline, is your neighbor the Ripper? Ah, yes. We've established that the Ripper is not a feral vampire, but could be anyone walking the streets, or selling you meat, <laughs> or even that odd fellow who lives down the block. I am liking this more. And if the paper offers a reward for information leading to the capture and arrest of the Ripper, $500. $100. $100. $100. But you, uh, for you to send in your tip to the Portland Chronicles and pick up the next edition to see if your tip caught the East Side Ripper. It's better than a contest. You can even run speculation and get odds on which day will be Ripper Day when <laughs> we get caught. Get on this, Jeffries. I see a gold mine in this. I need stories, lots of Ripper stories to keep the interest alive. Keep those tips coming, folks, and we'll give you clues every morning. I've got a meeting with the, the inspector. We're taking a different tack now that more is known about the Ripper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't waste time here. Off, off with you. Uh, give me copy as soon as you can. Anything. Make up something if you have to. McGraw's preliminary finding brought a new thinking to tracking the whereabouts of the East Side Ripper. I had secured myself a part of this inf investigation as a vampire expert of the city. A sort of expert resource. But now I pitched myself as an expert on all things shady to keep in the loop of the inquiries. 
We regrouped our orientation and line of inquiry and began to strategize how best to protect the populace as well as pursue the perpetrator. When the trail suddenly got hot again, the Ripper struck another time. Friday, April 24th, 1245 Ante Meridium. Judith Wilson offered to be the evening's entertainment for a gentleman who was claiming he was in search of a diversion. She had no idea what kind of diversion he had in mind. As was consistent with the previous Ripper murders, this new victim was also a lady of the practice. So we went to the streets of the east side to find out if we could identify her and what her activities might have been that led up to just prior to her death. It was my idea to get a cut of fabric from her evening attire, as it was very common for women of modest means to not have anything other than one evening outfit. And the paisley pattern on her fabric was memorable enough. We took it to all the working girls we could find on the east side, which, per my suggestion, precluded our being accompanied by uniformed police, as that might serve to frighten away the very people we were determined to engage and interview. Excuse me, miss. Fancy a bit of entertainment for an evening? Uh, no, but thank you. Uh, I'm looking for a specific someone. Well, if you're looking for a referral, I could enjoy a finder's fee for the service. We are looking for an escort for entertainment who would be wearing something like this pattern of fabric. Oh, very particular, aren't we? Well, that looks like Judith's rag. Sad thing to hear about her with a ripper and all. You know, how'd you come across a bit of tresses, eh? Uh, do you know who had been with Judith the night of her death? Yeah, there was this gentleman, though I use the term loosely. He wanted a girl to accompany him to an entertainment, you can know. You, can you describe him? Well, I didn't pay much mind to his features after he produced a wad of money. I can tell you he wasn't much of a looker. But he got more rough than to my liking that I decided to skip it and let Judith have the night. Looks like it was a good decision in the end, eh? Do you know where they may have gone for the evening? You mentioned something about the midnight show at the Grand Guignol. Talk about a place of ill repute. Makes a whorehouse look like a respectable garden party. <laughs> for our inquiries at the theatre where the Grand Guignol plays, they weren't rightly forthcoming. I got us into the establishment with the owner under a pretense... But once the inspector identified himself, things got a little cagey. Oh, I'm sorry. Our clients here for our shows are practically anonymous. We keep it mysterious, we keep it lively, we keep it intimate, and we keep it very discreet. You know, I just might invite the entire precinct of police to come down here and view your entertainment. Then you wouldn't have to worry about keeping things discreet. Uh, that would ruin us quite unfair, I might say. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, there was a man there that night with this Judith girl. It was approached by one of our people. I'll have you talk with her. Clara! Don't need to do about that strange couple the other night. Which strange couple? Show her the cloth. The rude man and the quiet girl. She was wearing this. Oh, that strange couple. Your name is Clara? Who's asking? What can you tell us of the man that was there that night? <laughs> oh, well, the girl, she's pretty much an amateur. It's a wonder she didn't starve to death. Ah, too shy. But the know. man, what can you tell us about the man? <laughs> oh, yeah, you couldn't miss that one. Nearly ruined the performance he did. First for his looks. Shit, that scowl. Secondly, for his manners. He was a cruel one, I could tell. I tried to, uh, you know, interest him in a bit of distraction in joining the two of them. And he threatened me with that walking stick of his. Walking stick? Yeah, tops with a bear's head it was. All metal or silver. He rebuffed your advances then? Right away. I tried once more. <laughs> you know what he said? Tell me. He said, not you, because you'd be missed. I had no idea what that meant. He meant, it meant you're lucky. Do you know which way they went? Ask a dull man. He'd have the address if he wished with a steam buggy for him. Take him home, I assume. Or at least to one of her homes. The girl never made it home. We got the address from the doorman who arranged for their steam cart to a residence in the Hawthorne district on Richmond Street. It was turning into a soggy, drizzly evening as we went to the Hawthorne, which had a number of rental squares and flats for hire. There were perhaps five floors of the building we'd been given, all with rooms that could be rented monthly, weekly, daily. 
or for less. We took turns watching the residence and its traffic coming in and out for hours. Finally, at a very late hour that evening, a gentleman approached who matched the description given us and who was, in addition, carrying the very same walking stick described to us. When Inspector Ferris saw him, he confronted him. Excuse me, sir. I'm Constable Ferris. I would like to ask you... What? Hey! Come back! I told you identifying yourself would scare him off before we could apprehend him. I cannot detain a citizen without first identifying myself as an officer of the law and for what business I mean to do it. Well, now he's gone back into his building. And as it is filled with private residences, we do not have a key to access. I will fetch the landlord and he will give us access. Yes, but the trail will be cold by then. I slipped away with the inspiration of an idea. I ran around to the alleyway on the side of the building and looked up at the row of windows on the side. Shortly, with the right amount of time allowed, a light came on on the third-story corner. It was too coincidental for it to have been just a random person this late at night, though I couldn't be sure enough to have the police violate the residence on the strength of a light being turned on. I began climbing up the side of the building, using the window ledges and the stones on the corner for purchase. I reached the third story and then peered inside. The light was still on in the room, with a bed in the corner and a gas light burning on the nightstand, and a person who appeared passed out on the bed. I attempted to lift the window open to gain access, but my hand slipped in the rain and slippery stone, and in a gasping moment, I found myself staring down three stories, hanging by one hand, and my fingers about to lose their grip under my weight. Among my shriek of surprise and my subsequent loud gasps of excitement as I dangled there, I neglected to hear the window of the suspected man's flat be thrown up, but my arm felt the undeniable grip of a strong hand steadying me and relieving my spent fingers of their burden. I suddenly realized that my life may be entirely in the care of a man whom I believed could possibly be the city's worst mass murderer, the East Side Ripper. My situation did not look promising. Give me your other hand. After a couple of unsuccessful attempts, I was able to swing up my free flailing arm and grab a hold of his other hand. And with a bit of cooperation and grunting, I was hefted into the stranger's quarters, panting from the exertion and the excitement of nearly falling to my death. Well, that was a close one. Good heavens, my dear lady, what could have possibly possessed you to be outside and so high up at such peril? Uh, you, sir, I'm afraid. I? Whatever do you mean, madam? Your pursuit. I was determined to secure your identity and your lodging so that the inspector could make entrance without error. Inspector? What do you mean? This is most extraordinary. Why should a police inspector have an interest in myself or my lodgings? To make inquiry, sir, and possible apprehension for crimes of a most heinous nature. The man's expression changed in that moment from genuine confusion and concern to a softening of features his screwed-up brow suddenly released. His eyes went from wide and inquisitive to suddenly understanding, and his posture and whole demeanor changed instantly from challenge and defense to realization and understanding. I could barely hear his words when he finally spoke, so quiet and weighted were they. What did he do? Forgive me, sir, but the police are wishing to inquire to someone matching your description and clothing about matters pertaining to the East Side Ripper. The East Side Ripper? Yes, We have great reason to believe now that it is human, not vampire. He stood up, eyes wide, and I could tell by a quick glance at the exit that he, for a fleeting moment, considered flight. But then he sank down again upon the bed, defeated and despondent. Yes, and rightfully so, I would imagine. Why do you say that? I am a student of nature, you see, though more of a student of the unnatural within nature, if you get my meaning. Your meaning sounds familiar, but it is incomplete. Please, tell more. Um... My name is Dr. Jensen. I study the sciences, uh, chemistry, physiology, biology, zoology. Uh, My fascination began when I was studying the phenomena of civilized vampires turning feral. That a refined and and cultured being could revert into such an utterly rude, base, and animalistic creature. I reason that there must be some physiological change at a base chemical level. So I studied the chemical effects before and after a vampire had gone feral and uh, devised a formula which would reproduce this effect... In humans. A formula? Yes, of of a transformative nature. Uh, Though, as it turned out, the body would process the dynamic aspects of the formula and would only be in a temporary state. Still, there was a breakthrough, and uh, so I endeavored to test my discovery in anonymity and sought out a temporary place of residence, uh, these these rooms, 
uh, to make that transformation and embody it. You transformed yourself? Yes. I thought I would be able to observe myself and note what sort of behaviors would evidence themselves while under the influence of the formula. My first trial, I had thought that I had only passed out as I had no recollection of the time passed while under its influence. Subsequent trials, however, brought me to the conclusion that I was indeed an awakened and alert state while under transformation, but possessed no memory of my activity while transformed. I anticipated that I would be in an instinctual state like feral vampires and not possess knowledge of technology such as door locks or window shutters, so I would spend a relatively harmless time within the walls of my abode. This was a tragic error upon my part, as I soon realized that I retained all my faculties of reason as before, and so was free to unlock my self-imposed prison and go out and mix and mingle with society, converse, almost undiscoverable, it would seem. How did you know you did this if you have no memory? Uh, By the evidence that would be left when I would return to my normal state, I... I would find that my clothing was wet from walking the streets, my boots muddied, my walking stick moved, money had been consumed. I would even find evidence of an evening's outing, a playbill from a production, a receipt from purchases. It was almost as if my, uh, my alter ego was leaving taunting clues for me to find during its dormancy. I continued the trials with the hope of being able to piece together a pattern of behavior based on what was left behind afterwards, but I had, I had no idea... He fell into a short silence. The East Side Ripper, you say? I read the accounts in the newspaper and naturally found them horrible, but... Another silence. And then, with a trembling voice, he added... I I, I suppose now that explains why my my shaving case had changed location. And the razor, I... I thought thought it curious, but didn't, didn't think that... Sir, if you are under the influence of something unknown, there may be legal circumstances. Legal circumstances? Legal circumstances which absolve you of the legal liability for your actions. Oh, for this? For this? Maybe for damaged property or, or, or public disruption, but for this? I am wholly responsible for my own actions, no matter which state I am in. That may be. Although our law demands that a person be allowed to confront their accusers. May I make a suggestion? What kind of suggestion? You referenced that your alter ego in its transitional state may have a different identity or consciousness than your own. Perhaps you could transform yourself so that the inspector may inquire to the person with the conscious memories of the actual crimes. If there are motives or circumstances which may be for consideration, these can only be discovered by inquiring to your alter ego. There is merit in what you say. I would be of no help whatsoever of these inquiries and would only have circumstances to recommend me for what I may be ultimately responsible. Uh, For I tell you, I have no desire to skirt my responsibilities should I be the cause for these tragedies. If I have indeed unleashed a monster within myself, it is I alone who is liable. We discussed eventually the inspector would call upon this residence in a search once he gained entrance to the building's interior. It was agreed that the doctor would make his transition and that I would retain his transformed state in his rooms until the official inquiry would arrive. I suppose I may have underestimated what cunning I would be faced with when the doctor made his transition. The doctor produced from a cupboard a flask, which he said contained his compound. He measured out some of it into a tumbler and then made the equal measurement of brandy, which he also poured into the glass. This is not part of the compound, but it does help it go down as it is particularly disagreeable to drink onto itself. He tossed back the concoction, still gagging a short bit, and then braced himself upon the counter and said nothing, but closed his eyes. At first he began to shiver, then the convulsions came in earnest. He cried out, fell to the ground, in a full fit of thrashing, and I feared he would not stop or would die from the violence of his potion. At last the shaking stopped and his frantic, ragged breathing began to slow into a regular rhythm. Presently, he began slowly rolling on his side, and I helped him to sit upon his cot, where he wiped the sweat from his face and then held his hands in his head, in his hands for quite some time. In a moment, he looked up at me, and my heart jumped as I looked into his eyes. His countenance held a beast, a trapped animal, a wildness that spoke without words. His shoulders hunched and his body tensed. I did not know if he meant to flee the rooms or attack me. At this point, I recounted my commitment to retaining him within the rooms, which meant I should be on the other side of the room between he and the doorway. But I also found myself loath to be that obstruction. 
Then the fight-or-flight instinct wore away and his body relaxed, though he kept his eyes upon me. Those eyes. He attempted to speak, but only croaked out a sound which led to a coughing and a clearing of his throat before he gained his composure again and spoke his first words. I take it my previous anonymity has been compromised. I was surprised at his address, its intelligence and economic eloquence. I suppose I had been expecting some halting words with no grammar or learning evident. This was not the feral beast our good doctor had been expecting. I shook myself out of this reverie and made to answer in the most neutral way possible. Yes, I could suppose you could say that. Pity. I had been relying upon my benefactor to maintain privacy for a longer interval. Your benefactor? Our common acquaintance, the good doctor. What else would you call someone who grants you life and advantages without anything asked in return? You make a dress as if he were someone else entirely. There is nothing that I am that is a consequence of him. I am wholly myself without his influence, save for his ability to summon me from my slumber at his choosing. I had enjoyed my own world, my own living, my own being without him, although it would seem he now has desired a witness to that which he himself cannot observe. I am here by virtue of chance and discovery. I happened upon you as you lay passed out from your last foray, or him and his circumstances as he awoke. I am not part of his experiment to observe. Though I would have inquiries I would wish to put to you, if you would be of mind. I am of such a mind. And such a mind I would imagine you would wish to examine. You only have memory of what you do when you are transformation? Memory, yes. But this life is more complete than my own. Short-lived as it is. And so I can make more of his life by his leavings than he of mine. And I control that which I leave behind as well. So he may not suspect all my activities. Your activities? I swallowed. You go out among the populace? Yes. You go to entertainments? Yes. You employ companions to accompany you? Yes. You... Do I kill them as uh, when I'm done? Is that what you wish to ask? I was physically taken aback by the forwardness of his question. He laughed shortly, <laughs> his smile replaced by an ugly look of contempt. Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. But why? I lack the civilization that the rest of you parade around with. The stilted politeness, the putting on of airs, the silly mask you wear to appear as faint kindness or deference. I have not this mask of so-called civility. I am only what I am, and I make no apologies. But why do you kill? Because I can. <laughs> I do all manner of things not normally considered moral or legal or right. I do them when I want, where I want, when it strikes my fancy, when I am so inclined. It is the only true freedom we as people can truly enjoy, as would you, were it not for the unbearable training you have suffered to dictate what is allowable under this so-called civilization. I have not an obligation to your laws, morals, and such. I am free to do whatever I wish, when I wish it. You would agree. But you simply cannot wreak havoc and inflict harm in the violation of others to visit violence upon their personal property. So say you. But... I do. There are laws... Which I reject. Laws to supposedly protect the weak or to distribute fairness across the land. Let me ask, is it fair to be born into affluence? Is it fair to be born into poverty? I say it is not. 
And if the supreme being has seen to it that one is born rich, the other poor, one being strong, one weak, one being born of a lesser tribe, another the greater, who am I to obey laws which fly in the face of his great will? I inflict hazard and harm upon another. The Supreme One wills it. That is not the will of the Almighty. Ah, I speak not of some spiritual figurehead or arbitrary assignment. I speak of the God of nature, the mother to us all, who is thrown into the hostility of her bosom, to whom only the strong survive, only those who fully embrace our natural will and not chain into submission with morals and laws to hold up the weak and helpless. And if I can visit my desire upon you, be it base, carnal, violent, or domination, you shall bend to that will or be destroyed. We are not animals. We do not live according to the law of the jungle. That's what separates us from the beasts. What separates you from the beasts is you have domination over them. You have taken the best lands, the best vegetation. You have subjected them, enslaved them, and you have eaten them. It is only your law which keeps you from turning upon yourselves in the same manner. That is what you fear the most. Why these girls? I make no distinction. In fact, I have respect for them. Exploiting the base habits and urges of the menfolk, it's just too bad for them that the good population uniformly shames them for the practices. And in that hypocrisy bringing their own judgment against their good selves. If you respect them, then why do you victimize them? Because of the absurdly scandalous means by which they are not esteemed even in their own culture by their own kind. I would wager some of the more upright gentles when hearing the dirty girls have been so misused, beaten and slashed that they have remarked and good riddance to them or they got what they deserved. Or, it's time to take out the trash anyways. No self-respecting gentleman or constable would be too eager to catch a killer who was doing the public a service. But, kill one woman of society, violate someone of good reputation, one of their own, and in this manner, and the public revolt would reach the heavens. For you would cry in objection to reach the... The heavens and the resources released to apprehend the fiend would be limitless. So it is nothing personal to the women I do prey upon. It's just a matter of practicality. Open up! This is an official investigation! Ah, now I understand your being here. Come in, Inspector. I believe you are acquainted with this lady. What? How did you get in here? Alternate means. She's been detaining me for your arrival. Seems you're in search of the East Side Ripper. Exactly. Do you have an accounting of your whereabouts? I'm the man that you are looking for. On the evenings in question. I am the subject of your investigation. If you fail to have an alibi, we may Idiot! have Idiot! To... I am your murderer! Uh, b- b- what? Must I be plain? I... Am the East Side Ripper. Have you no shame, sir? None. And I am no sir. Or at least fear for yourself. What fear? In a short amount of time, I shall retreat back into the consciousness of my benefactor, and he in turn will pay the price for my actions. You planned this all along, didn't you? <laughs> It was a contingency, to be certain. Surely you'll pay for this, man. No, sir, I won't. Someone else will. What kind of a monster are you? I assure you, one for which you have no imagination to comprehend. And one thing that the good doctor has not taken into account is that I no longer require his chemical draft to make the transformation, but instead can be done at will. I have a feeling that my host will be relying upon me when spending time incarcerated. Of all the many constructs and institutions of mankind, it is the savageness of prison which most recreates the jungle and embraces the precepts of nature and the survival of the fittest. I shall thrive there. 
I shall finally be among those who understand me and not have to keep up this ridiculous facade of civilization when I am among my own. I doubt it will be prison for you, animal. What? You'll go straight to the hangman's noose for sure. The trial will only be a formality. And you and your corruption will be hung by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. I reject that this hypocritical citizenry should hold judgment over me. I refuse to acknowledge its authority. You are coming with me to your ultimate demise, sir. I shall not submit to you or any one of this dreadful society. He grabbed up his walking stick and raised it up to strike. And in that same moment, the inspector drew his revolver and fired. The Ripper stood frozen for a moment, stunned by the impact of the firearm, and then lurched forward to resume his attack, and the inspector fired in succession four times, each one sending him backwards with each shot, until he fell through the window. I jumped after him and grabbed his arm before he plummeted, and held on as he dangled and shook there in the rain. He looked down below him. And when he looked up again, I saw not the hated face of the Eastside Ripper, but instead the face of the kind doctor who had not a short time earlier held my hand as I dangled precariously beneath his window ledge. Hold on! He looked me squarely in the eyes, the pain from his wounds and otherwise clearly on his face. I am sorry! And he released (gasps) from my grip and slipped fully from my grasp and disappeared to the ground amid the dark and the rain. The police closed the cases involving the East Side Ripper and notated them as solved and attributed all the crimes to a feral vampire who had been tracked down and killed. The daily newspaper held the headline, East Side Ripper Stopped by Police. And the story therein contained a recap of the awful murders, very little about the events of the apprehension or indeed death of the Ripper. And a commentary about what this means for our fair city and populace now that a vampire monster no longer walks among us. Now, it is said that a monster no longer walks among us, but I wonder, since the real monster was awakened within the good and fair doctor, doesn't this mean that we are all potential monsters, buried beneath the thin veneer of polite society? And who among us may be next to shun the fabric of society and politeness we all clothe ourselves with and live outside the laws which protect and preserve the ideals of our culture? I can only hope that the good doctor's research has not been discovered, or better yet, discovered and destroyed, or forever lost, that we never again need fear the unleashing of that monster upon us. This has been the Steam Portland Chronicle stories from a time in Portland's past that never happened. You have been listening to Nightmares from the Shadows, written and directed by David Ian and performed by the Scary Home Radio Players. Sam A. Mowry, Patricia Blem, David Ian, Daniel Roven, Karen O'Brien, Mondi Koshnevasan. Foley sound effects by Scream Vina and David Ian. Music and sound files by Mark Rose and visuals by Joe Medina. Consider yourselves fortunate. You have just survived. Nightmares, Nightmares from the Shadows! And that's this week's show. Were you happy to visit it in person, Jack? Oh. Thanks to the magic of the tortoise. It is magic, right? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Sherlock Holmes? Uh, Close. Arthur C. Clarke. Well, check for the links to this week's show at sonicsociety.org. Contact us through sonicsociety at gmail.com or through x at sonicsociety or at David Alt if you know why the universe is a foot and five inches askew. Askew? Well, it sounds better than just wrong. Until next week, I I hope we get more information on this mystery. Let's get back to the tortoise. I'm David Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Have a lovely day.
Cinema Production. You start with an idea, a what if. Then you populate this idea with characters, heroic, cowardly, dramatic, humorous, scheming, clueless, as many as you want. Then you stir them briskly in a plot that turns this way and that until a satisfying ending is achieved. You've just written an audio drama. The challenge is, can you write one and finish it before the end of February? That's the challenge of National Audio Drama Script Writing Month. So get busy. For details, go online to sonicsociety.org slash nadsrum. That's N for national, A for audio, D for drama, S for script, W-R-I for writing, and M for month. Don't ask me why writing is represented with three letters. I didn't come up with it. But maybe I could write an audio drama explaining why. Hmm... 